titled this, uh, and in fact, this was handed to me, Solar 101. Let's try to zip that up a little bit. Solar basics to power your house and shower you with sunshine. The shower, with shower, shower you with sunshine comes from, I'm in a Habitat for Humanity house, and I was washing my hands after whatever I was doing, and a little kid came by who was, they had a board meeting, and uh, this little kid came by and looked in the bathroom and said, hey, mister, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm washing my hands with sunshine. He goes, what does that mean? <clears throat> and I got to perfect lesson opportunity, or you know, you talk about these moments where you can inject and a, and, and, a, and a young kid has actually got the ears on, and, is, oh, and I explained to him how the solar system worked. And, and it, 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 it's, you know, if, if I would have tried to say, hey, sit down here, I'm going to tell you about the solar, I would have never got it. But he was interested in that comment. And, and to me, and I know this is somewhat tangential, but there's so much to learn both from wind and from sun as far as basic science. You know, and, I, and I really think there's some value to taking our schools and doing some of these things, like Cleveland State has done, because it's just basic good science that will be useful even if you're working on coal or nuclear power plant. You know, it, and it's fun, and, and, and kids tend to, to really be attracted to it, and so I think it is a very good medium to, to teach off of. Um, I wanted to start this one off, off also with what I had found to be a pretty nice little instructive uh, video. Hi, welcome to the Solar Generation Road Trip. If you want to know how solar energy is working for America, you have to go out and ask America. So let's go. We're going to be driving across the entire country, checking out just how far solar energy has come. We had the solar system installed on the roof a year ago. Our energy bills have been reduced approximately 30%. This is an affordable housing project. Twelve families are going to be moving in here. They may end up having no electrical bills. The installer was right here on Cape Cod, so we even had some local jobs as a result of this. There's a lot of opportunities for folks to take advantage of both solar electric and for solar thermal. These panels have been uh, installed for approximately three years, and uh, they've reduced our energy consumption. Our electric bills have gone from $200 a month to $2 a month means that I can rely on power that's generated from my roof or my city, and it means that I don't have to rely on foreign oil. And our seller came and looked at the house, and then looked at the barn and said, this is perfect for that. I'm here at the Crayola factory in Pennsylvania, and I'm standing with Anjan. Tell me about these solar panels. The solar panel provides enough energy to produce one billion Crayola fans. Pocono Raceway has the largest solar field of any sport facility anywhere in the world. I'm here at the governor's mansion. So, Ron, what does solar energy mean to Ohio? Solar energy means jobs. We've actually got over a thousand employees. Those are all largely new jobs that we've created and brought to the area. This house is completely solar powered. It has solar photovoltaic panels on the roof and solar thermal collectors on the side of the house. By using solar panels to generate electricity at Mizzou, we're reducing our carbon footprint. So there you have it, solar bears. Frankly, in this country, we're far behind. And if we don't save now, we're going to be in trouble later. Solar energy really works for us here at the River Street Bakery. Our bread is going to be 100% solar. Solar power means innovation. Working with the world and not against it. Protecting our future generations. Pushing the limits. Solar energy means clean and green energy for my family. It's a great thing we're doing for the environment, and we're proud of it. We're at a gas station with no gas. Correct. We've added electric vehicle charging stations, which are being powered by the sun. Solar energy is an opportunity to really change how we do business going into the future. Thomas comes from Germany and is bringing a different perspective to Fort Collins on solar energy. Solar energy created already over 300,000 jobs in Germany. You have to get the politicians behind it, and then you can create an enormous success story, much bigger than the one we have in Germany. Solar energy is just taking advantage of what's out there, the mature technology, especially the solar thermal. Why not use it? These dishes are concentrating solar power, enough for a whole town. This array feeds into our grid. We move water from the California aqueduct to the farmers and avoid the utility costs. Solar thermal is that simple and very efficient. I just realized that solar is the answer. 
solar energy is the future. And here at AT&T Park with the San Francisco Giants, we're about clean energy, we're about technology, and solar combined with those two things. Well, go Giants. Go Giants. Annually, we generate 155,000 kilowatts. It's enough energy to make 300,000 bottles of wine. Well, we did it. Coast to coast, 4,436.2 glorious miles across 15 states. On our journey, I think that we have proved that solar energy has come a long way, too. Solar really is working for America, whether it be just a few panels on a homeowner's roof or a huge array that can power a whole town. We have talked to some amazing people and made wonderful new friends amongst those working in the solar energy industry and with their customers and clients, too. They are all really good people who care about the future of this country. They are people of different colors and different creeds and many different ages but we've come to think of them as one generation. Welcome to the Solar Generation. Go to solargenerationusa.org and find out how easy it is to go solar now. Uh, <clears throat> similar to wind, possibly even more amazing, at least to me, was PV installed in this last year will be more than the cumulative total installed in all prior years in this country. Okay, so <laughs> 4.3 gigawatts of solar PV in 2012. That's the path that we're on. If you add up everything that we've done, we've doubled it. I'm surprised at that. This is the third straight year in which solar PV has more than doubled in the U.S. Uh, electricity generated from the solar PV creates more jobs than any other energy source. So today you can't say anything good until you say jobs. And, 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 and I find, and I, I guess I just don't want to jump too ahead of my story, but, but um, I, I started to I helped a, a friend of mine start a small solar company in, in Knoxville, and he wanted to build zero energy houses. That's, he was going to be a contractor, and that's where he started. And his business right now is 100% solar. It's, it's just, you know, that's what just, and, and, he's, and he's hiring, he's growing like crazy. He always said, yeah, yeah, you got to be energy efficient. There's so much to do there. But the business has just boomed in Knoxville. On, on his solar activities. That's where all of his revenue. So it's kind of like you get out there, you think you want to do this, and oh, here's where the action is. Uh, PVA, PV creates uh, up to eight times as many jobs per uh, unit of electricity as coal and natural gas. Uh, and this data comes from that website. I, here's where I kind of do a little uh, you know, respect to the subject matter that I was given here, uh, Solar 101. I apologize if some of you know all of this, but the way I hope that this will be used is that, you know, some of these things, you know, you'll be able to go to as this gets archived, and if you need to, that information, you'll go and get it, but if these are things you already know, be able to jump over. But I, I, I find it and, I, and I, I learned this the hard way. I got through so much material when I talked with my architect students the first couple of years. I thought I was bestowing all this to them, and then they would ask me questions as they got to know me a little bit. And I, and I probably get through about half as much material because I found that I was using a vocabulary that not everybody was necessarily comfortable with. So, so, part, so I apologize to some of you, but I think sometimes it's important just to make sure we're, we understand the, you know, some of the basics here. So photovoltaic cells are they're made from special materials called uh, semiconductors, such as silicon. And when light strikes the cell, a certain portion of it is absorbed when the semiconductor, within the so, so, semiconductor material. This means that the energy of the absorbed light is transferred to this material, the semiconductor. The energy knocks electrons loose, allowing them to flow freely. PV cells also have one, of the more, one or more electric fields that act to force electrons freed by light 
absorption to flow in a certain direction. So you got everybody heading in the right, you know, not, not random, but heading in a certain direction. And this flow of electrons is a current, and by placing metal on both sides of this, you're able to collect this, uh, uh, this power that, uh, from, the, from this current. And I'm going to step down even deeper here. And I really love doing this when I'm talking to a chemistry class because many of them have beat on the periodic table and there's a ton of stuff here. But this talks to them at the time when they are already exposed to something and kind of explains this. Uh, the start with silicone from the periodic table. Um, and many of you, you know, the chemistry classes particularly, they're familiar with where it's positioned. And, 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 and in this row compared to this one and compared to that one. And I'm going to show you why I point that out here. Uh, silicon has four electrons in its outer orbital. So this allows them to form nice crystals. Uh, the four electrons form perfect covalent bonds with four neighboring atoms. And it creates this lattice work. So when we talk about uh, covalent bonds, for several of you may not have been in your chemistry books lately, that's, uh, that results from sharing one or more pairs of electrons. Uh, this leaves no free electrons to conduct electric current. This makes a silicone crystal an insulator rather than a conductor. So this isn't the only material we need to make this happen. If it was pure silicone, we wouldn't be generating. So we have to, we have to add impurities, if you will. And I always get a chuckle. It scares me when I get a chuckle in front of high school kids when I say it's all about doping, you know. Uh, you know no, not that kind of doping. <laughs> anyway, uh, doping is used to make a, a semiconductor. So you, you got an N-type and a P-type. And the N-type is uh, phosphorus or arsenic is added. So there's your impurity to the silicone in small quantities. Phosphorus, arsenic each have five outer electrons, not four. So they're out of place when they get into the silicone lattice. The fifth electron has nothing to bond to, so it's free to move around. It takes only a small amount of impurity to create enough free electrons to allow an electric current to flow through the silicone. N-type silicone is a good conductor, unlike an insulator, which pure is. Electrons have a negative charge, hence that's why you have this n-type. And now with that, you need a p-type, and the way you dope it is you don't add that impurity, if you will, you add boron or gallium or something of that sort as your dopant. Boron and gallium each have only three outer electrons. Silicon had four, uh, here you had an extra one, here you got one less. So the when you mix into the silicone lattice, they form holes in the lattice where a silicone electron has nothing to bond to. So the absence of an electron creates the effect of a positive charge, hence the name p-type. Holes can conduct current. A hole happily accepts an electron from a neighboring, moving the hole over a space. So p-type is a good conductor. So, there's your, there's your basic chemical explanation of uh, PV cell. Is that necessary for further discussion of is solar good or not? Absolutely not. You don't even have to know a thing. But I think, you know, the fact that solar is so here, our kids can be around it, they all see it, I think it has an opportunity to teach and explain, as opposed to distance generation of power that nobody even bothers to ask you know, how it got, how the light came on. So, I, 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 like I say, I think that's important. We're in an educational institute. The ability to excite and, and uh, get questions asked and then providing answers is very, very important and about where we're, at, we're sitting. Uh, this was a, a, a really nice piece of work that was done uh, uh, from an economist. And uh, it kind of puts in an interesting perspective, particularly alluding to a comment I made earlier about who should really be driving the ship on whether we should be growing solar in Tennessee or not. So just bear with me on a second, because I think there's a really interesting point here. Solar PV is not very competitive with fossil fuel. 
like natural gas from the perspective of a utility that can either build a new natural gas power plant or invest in solar installations. I'm going to show you a curve in the next presentation. Gas has just zoom, done this. So if I'm somebody that's trying to generate electric power at the lowest possible cost, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build you know, combined cycle or gas, get gas turbines. That is no question. At the moment, the cheapest way for an electric utility to build capacity and to get, get electric generation. However, we're not the utility. We're just renting from this utility. That's motivated by this. For a commercial power user, say a business with plenty of rooftop space, and I'm going to talk about Walmart because Walmart, I just had a very nice meeting with them and they, they said something very interesting to me. The cost of generating your own electricity is now on par with what the business would need to pay in the retail price. So because Walmart's so big, they get a power for about as low as anybody. And right now, my good friend, who I'm doing work with, tells me, oh, too bad TVA cut off the solar to 50 kW. Because if they want to continue paying me, man, I got lots of roof. They're making money from day one. They don't own it. They're just given that roof space. But because of their, their good cash flow, they're ideal for third party to come in, use their space, and put up, put up uh, roof systems. So TVA has said, you know, we can't do all these big units. We need to, you know, so this is for the masses. We need to put a cap on it. But in this case, and believe me, I mean, Walmart, they have these little rooms with hardly any windows. They put you in. They put you up against the wall. What do you mean five cents an hour is too much? You know, give me, you can, yeah, I got a guy I'll work for three. Okay, I'll work for two. You know, and, and I mean, they just hammer everybody. There's 6,000 vendors, including any, anybody like me that walks in with their hand out. And, and so these guys really look carefully at their cash flow. And that is a truism today in this area that Walmart would be very happy to fill, fill up their, their roofs with the arrangement that is now available to them. The fill in, in this, but this bigger picture, the facility has to be favorable location. And obviously, I'm going to show a solar map in a minute, twice the solar power in the, 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 the southwest than we have here. The business must be able to take advantage of the current federal tax subsidies. Now, granted, you know, and Walmart in that scenario, I just is obviously taking advantage of that as well. For commercial and residential, solar, the benchmark is the retail price of electricity. While for utility scale projects, it's the wholesale price. The difference between the two is the cost of transmission, distribution, administration. That's everything that gets you from the generation to the delivery. And, and, and so I, I, I kind of worry a little bit. So right now, we let this electric utility determine our solar future or not. And so, you know, again, they're the only show in town. But I'm a little concerned um, when, when we have been in that kind of situation. And so anyway, I, just, I, I think that's just an interesting way of putting our particular situation into this bigger picture. In a large part, solar PV panels are semiconductors. And you know, one of the interesting things, and, and I'm going to allude to this, the, the, the cost is absolutely just, just like natural gas, is just nosedived. And, and, and Moore's Law, and for those of you that don't know Moore's Law, is you know, with computers, we know this, and we feel this, and we see this. You know, we bought a couple of computers. You know, this price just keeps nosediving. So in a sense, Moore's Law does apply to solar, it, although traditionally it refers to the rate at which the number of transistors doubles on an integrated circuit board. The context of solar panels, it appears that whenever the total cumulative amount of panels produced doubles, the unit cost decreases 20%. So, you know, that, and there's a lot of things that are going into this. I mean, like, we've got a, a lot of people that were expecting a huge growth in solar, and they built up all this capacity, and now, right about now, now we've got a recession, you know, so, you know, that's driven the price down. But, but that's really interesting that, and, 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 and I heard somebody came up to me, uh, the gentleman that was here, by the way, big builder and very knowledgeable, uh, you know, yeah, solar, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and a, man, if you did the numbers crunching them a year ago, you, you better go back and revisit because the scenario is changing so fast. You know that we have two 
two major solar manufacturers in one, and that you're just starting up in uh, South Henry County. Parker Chemical? Yes. You know that thing? Yes. The one out in the West Tennessee area, too. It's further along, I think. Yeah. Well, here's, here's an interesting, and, and, and TVA's pointed out to me, look, we can play in the solar game in a big way by keeping our powers absolutely low, lower than anybody, because these are energy intensive, and let's, let's make everybody's stuff, and then make money selling this, you know, so you're, you're exactly right, there's, and, and, and one, my, in fact, my, the, the, my boss said to me, he says, you know, I, I really think the world would be better off. We just let TVA generate absolutely as cheap a power as they possibly can get away with. And let others incentivize others to save energy, to make solar as cheap as possible, wind as cheap. Let's not keep it all in the same house. And you know, we live in a complicated world. We can't just wish these things. But we're in a frustrating situation when I see the rest of the country. And I've been competing against my research colleagues from California. You know, they get all these great partners and all the tax money goes there. Oh, don't worry, you in Tennessee, TVA's taking care of you. Are they? So my personal path to zero started with, uh, I'm not sure how many slides jumped on me here, uh, with this one small house. And, I, you know, I read a book, uh, Alchemist, which talks about, and this is great for your kids and grandkids, you know, when you find what you were put on this earth for, others will help you, and you will, you will just be where you need to be. We, if we could instill that in 20% of the kids that come through this campus, you know, just find their gig and get them excited about it and send them away, everybody they bump into will say, hey, that's good, you know, here, let me help you here. You know, and I found mine. I found mine with this in 2002, and, and wherever I went, I would jump up and down and be all excited about it and surprise myself and surprise you. And then people would come back and just do stuff and, and, and give me a key piece of information. And so that's kind of what's gotten me onto the stage that I'm in, in today. And I kind of had this opportunity of taking five houses, making them a little bit better. I got on a cover of Mother's News, and I had a little bitty thing there that one of my dreams would be to kit this house. Very simple, very affordable. I got 1,800 emails. Now, these are people from Mother Earth News that like to do their own canning and everything like that. They generally are not a wealthy entity. But the concept, very, very, very intriguing to many, many people. Uh, I got a skateboard on top of the cover of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, techie, you know, and, and, and about, about these houses. So it was just a, a great story. You know, the, the one thing that um, uh, several pretty good-sized companies had heard was that these houses in this area actual cost 48 cents a day. You know, boom. You know, it's, it's like washing with sun. You know, how in the world did you do that? Let me look at it. Are you just BSing me? You know, how do you actually get to this? This is an absolute dead on, straight up, about five years ago number. It would be even better with the current buyback that TVA's got. And here's where I march through. And let me just, I'm going to spare you maybe. How many of you guys know what a kilowatt is? Kilowatt hour is okay. Okay, um, I'm going to kind of run through a little bit of this kind of quickly then. But uh, you know, you got it's very important that you understand. You know, here's a kilowatt, and here's a kilowatt hour. So when we talk about capacity, we have the capacity of of say a watt. So, but that it's not energy. That's just you know that's just um, power, if you will. That's the capacity. But if we use that kilowatt for one hour, that is a kilowatt hour. So that's, that's use of energy over time. And, 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 and that's not grasped as much as I kind of many times assume people understood it. And then here I'm doing just a few silly little things. It's like, you know, so a, a 10 100 watt bulbs for an hour, that's a kilowatt hour. Um, Compact fluorescence, much less. And so, and then the other thing I like doing with the slide, and I, and I continue to do this, <coughs> I went and looked at my August bill, my house, 9.4 cents. So I, I kind of, it, it grounds me. And now, know that in December, 
uh, of 2009, it was 21 percent less. So this is uh, uh, three years, it's gone up 7 percent per year. And then the one thing that you got to watch out for is the hookup charges. So on these very efficient houses, what's happening is the hookup charges are getting larger and larger. That means if you got power hooked to your house, that number is growing. If you have a very efficient house, you got to spread that hookup charge through a smaller number of kilowatt hours. And, and, so you, and, and that's what leads me to believe that as we get to very low efficient houses, we're not going to want to pay up hookup charges for two energy sources. We got to have electricity, but we may not have to have gas, particularly if we're very, very efficient in our water uh, heating and our space heating. Gas was crystal at about five or six this year from last year. Uh, gas went up their hookup costs. Yeah, right. right. My point, my, my point in spades, absolutely, absolutely. So you kind of say, if I got a really efficient house, I mean, yeah, you'd like to avoid it. It's, 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 it and it's hidden. It's, it's, I, I don't want it really, but, but you can figure it out over a couple of, a couple of months. But, and, and then you can call your, your distributor and they'll tell you. So uh, just on a continuing of this, I, I kind of play around with how much more efficient uh, LEDs are and then kind of some examples of uh, uh, breaking this out from conversion to joules, which many kids are used to and not uh, BTUs, and then kilowatts to horsepower, and then kilowatts to BTUs. So, you know, these are terms that you end up using and discussing these things, and, and, and it's not always understood what those conversions are, but um, so I, I provide them in this slide. So you can see if this would become uh, interactive on the web, you may want to just skip this if you get all this, or if people keep talking about a BT and you really don't want to know, well, come over here and we hopefully will get that. And then, you know, what is a BTU? British thermal unit. This is the, the uh, units that most of the time scientists and they're taught in schools with joules, not, not BTUs. And where does this all, what does this all mean? The amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. And then the other thing that gets used all the time is a ton of cooling. I got a three ton unit. What the heck does that mean? You know, that's 12,000 BTUs um, uh, per hour. And uh, another thing that we talk about is not site energy, but source energy. And when you get to source energy, that's the coal pile or, you know, uh, you know, where the electricity is generated, and we got to account for things like transmission and distribution efficiencies. We lose 10% there. Our power plant conversion, and these can vary, but, you know, it's only like 38%. The rest is lost. And so you, uh, you, you kind of kind of go through these uh, numbers to get how many BTUs, you know, to get to the, to the source BTUs, you, you've got you start with 3412, that is, say, resistance heat delivered to the site. When you go through these losses, you end up really having to spend, you know, three times more when you weigh these losses in. CO2 emissions from a house in the TVA service territory can be calculated when you know the mix of hydro, coal, nuke, natural gas. Then there's these fractions of that and this varies from moment to moment. If you're on peak capacity, it's going to be different than off peak. But hand wave, hand wave, you know, these are the weightings. So for every kilowatt hour, you're pushing out the 163 uh, grams of carbon. When I showed earlier, for those of you that were there, that little carbon footprint, nationally you can do one thing, and it's going to vary depending on where you are. We have a larger fraction of coal than the both coasts. And so our you know, and, and that's why, you know, by the way, if people are talking carbon tax, what would happen here in Tennessee if we don't get off the coal and, and on balance is we're going to get taxed for our electrical power higher than California and New York. And, and so this is the kind of concerns and why you really want to understand this to, um, as these discussions on how to balance this, this, uh, this world of solar, wind, coal, nuclear. So the U.S. per capita uses 5 million grams of carbon a year. 16% is from living in our house. The biggie is our car, but 
uh, and there's people that argue that, you know, we got to plant it here. <laughs> Everybody should only get so much carbon, and we got a lot of work to do if uh, that we ever get to a world that tries to e equate this. Um, I think I'm going to jump here, but therm is the unit that you generally build on, and I kind of walk through how much energy is actually in the unit that you sell for propane, natural gas, heating oil. I'm going to going to assume you guys, and you're going to have this if if you if you need it, and. Uh, a uh, ton of cooling, it comes from uh, the way air handlers were originally rated. The way we cooled ourselves originally is we bought ice and blew fans over it. So as a result, when melting ice, it gives up 144 BTUs per pound. Therefore, one ton of cooling provided the same amount of cooling as melting one ton of ice in a day. And that's, how, that's where the, the term ton, ton, ton came from. So, by the way, that's probably something I probably should have done at the beginning of the day, and, 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 but I, I felt at some point it needed to get archived here. So there was a question on what exactly is the TVA solar deal. And so it's in flux. Right now, it's called Generation Partner. It is going to be given a new name, but for now, this is the deal. Uh, TVA pays a one-time incentive of 1000 bucks towards the cost of your system. It guarantees a payment, as we talked about earlier, $0.12 um, for, for everything you generate. It's a buy-all, sell-all arrangement. So that's, uh, that's, that's for 10 years. The, so the utility rate uh, for residential and for commercial, it's GSA rate for you know, GSA 1, plus an additional $0.12. So if the utility rates increase or decrease, so does your payment. And this was a midstream change about four years ago, and a good one. We like that. You know, so if the price goes down, that differential still remains the same. Uh, so calculating, you know, this is kind of calculating solar energy output. You know, this is for solar collectors. Determine the daily solar radiation. Uh, for your area, you use a source resource map. These are the factors that you use to calculate for the Tennessee Valley. This is how you can kind of get an approximation for you know the conversion of a solar system for, for in general the valley. I've actually got computer models that are very simple to run, and you can compare exact same house, same collectors in Memphis, in Nashville, in, 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 in Johnson City, and it very, very simple sets of numbers that you can use to actually see how much of this solar perk you would be getting as you're trying to do your economics. This is the simple equation uh, for that production, the annual energy output in kilowatt hours per year. That's where you're going to get the 21 cents, and that is calculated by the solar system nameplate value. That is a nameplate and nameplate only. It's a collector, one meter by one meter, with a perfect light source about a meter away. And that's then measured. That's not what we have here in Tennessee. It's almost always something less. To my somewhat surprise, when I was teaching uh, codes and standards in Bermuda a couple of years ago, I witnessed collectors generate in excess of what I thought was perfect light. So they have so much more light there that they actually you know, are above what the rated conditions are. And then you take the annual solar radiation, and this accounts for, for cloud cover and such, and those give you your estimate of how much revenue you're going to be generating. Some very important solar principles. The higher the temperature caused by the solar radiation reduces the electric panel performance. So I experimented with this because I thought I would save the cost of all the hardware, and it's not trivial putting on solar. So I tried to eliminate it all and put the collectors as close as I could on the roof. And what I did indeed measure, and is confirmed by this, is that the efficiency fell off compared to those that were just about six inches off the roof. It would be better if it was actually, uh, you know, in an even more wind stream. And, and, and you kind of say, well, what is that penalty? Because I don't want an ugly something sitting on the ground. I'd like to have it blend in nicely with my, my, my roof. And I would tell you, without you know, having played with this, that you know, getting it up about five, six inches off the roof is, is an ideal situation. Keep it at the plane of the roof. 
Do not try to optimize, although there are people that do this, and all of a sudden you got some, something that could be aesthetically very pleasing to, probably not, if you're using a different plane than whatever that roof slope is. Uh, very important on orientation, there's people that have a roof facing west and a roof facing east. It is a big penalty when you do that. Uh, you probably ought to think about a solar on a pole. Yeah, because you get power in the morning, power in the night, and you end up at double the cost, really, when you, when, per, per unit of solar collector. So just, just keep that in mind. Uh, yeah. uh, in consideration for what you just said, would it be better to put the panels in the yard where you're not getting that heat reflection? The answer is yes. The answer is, is, is yes. But, but as far as, and, and here's the, how, how kind of, you can kind of do the numbers. I will tell you that behind that solar collector is going to be a good measurement of what you read on the bank, if it's a properly aspirated, shaded collector. When it gets on the roof, even, and here's an argument for putting these guys really close together. I don't want to get that hot roof hot near it. But what does happen is whatever area is underneath that roof, that heats up, and that heat tends to be carried under the collectors. And, and here's your calculation, and it's probably pretty decent, although I didn't, you know, I was doing field measurements, so it's, I didn't have nearly the precision. But it does fall off, and here, you know, so for your typical, you know, uh, crystalline silicone collector, 0.5% of the PV electrical performance per 1.85 degrees. So if it's 18, if it's 10 degrees difference, you know, 10, to, you know, that's 5%, that, that can be kind of serious. Um, another thing that you might consider, okay, so now you are on the ground. Well, can you go with single axis tracking? And these are pretty inexpensive now. They used to be more complicated. Or double axes, which is go this way and that way, always chasing the sun. Well, one axis, you can increase from your fixed position on the roof 24%. This is a pretty serious number. I mean, if I really have the space and it's not going to be an ugly thing in my backyard, it ain't a bad way to go. And when you look at the hardware of concrete and a pole compared to the hardware and the vulnerability of leaks on your roof, it ain't a bad you know, thing to, 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 to consider. Uh, two axes tracking by 30%. You know, 24 to 30, uh, you know, when the level of complexity, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, you know, I could be talked into this. Is that enough increment to get to me, you know, going multiple ways? I, I don't know. Uh, they cost more uh, when you solar track, as, as, as you can expect. Uh, additional mechanical components, big believer, I've been, you know, engineering 101, the more moving parts, the more things, you know, higher the maintenance costs. Uh, there's some been interesting things, and I'll tell you what, this seminar, I learned one thing Wednesday night, and that was, I'd always been saying, and this had been the case, that the biggest thing about solar is, well, look at the warranty. The warranty is for 25 years, which says that after 25 years, I should still be getting 80% of what I was getting on day one from the solar. And with the, with the traditional single inverter, which is the entire array fed down into this inverter, that inverter didn't have the warranty. It was more like five years, some of them 10 years. But these little micro inverters that are now available, strapped right to the bottom of each collector, it sure makes the installation easier. You just plug these guys in series and drop them down you're already at AC, so the solar collector generates at DC, goes into this little micro inverter for each of the collectors, and immediately changes it to, to alternating current, ready to be more, much more easily fed into either the grid or into your house. And the warranties on those are now good for 25 years. Did you know that? I didn't either. I, 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 I didn't know they were warranted anyway. Uh, we had a, uh, a solar installer, trained Cleveland State Community College, you know, so it must be a good source. Did you know that uh, uh, no on your solar panels and then have a sunny day will actually generate more power than you just, than you do when they normally would? I'm sorry? No. Very. And was, was generating more power than I had ever generated with those solar panels before. 
Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Which, which kind of says, you know, could I do a, you know, a, a white uh, patio or something in front of it to, to, to enhance? Or, you know, there, there'll be people that do the sawtooth roof. You know, that, you know what I do on that north-facing tooth you know, maybe could, could enhance the performance. Yeah, that is very interesting. Yes. Did you, did you have something? No. Oh, okay. Um, 30 percent. You got to make money to get this. So if you're unemployed, this gets tough. But 30 percent of the federal uh, residential personal renewable energy tax is alive and well. And that includes solar water, PV, wind, geothermal. And by the way, um, I was invited to a congressman's office. He had heard, his, one of his staffers had invited me to a congressman who proposed that geothermal be included in this. And he asked me what I thought of geothermal. And I, and I told him that I, I really didn't think as much of it as I thought of some of these other ones. And apparently he discounted my input and, and it, it has uh, now got included in there. But this, this really has been a boom uh, because generally that system is a premium. Take that 30% off and pure simple dollars and cents uh, particularly if you already have talked yourself into a mid-level to high-level air source heat pump, uh, this economics works pretty good. And, and, and amazingly, there's no max on this. So that used to be a constraint, but for, you know, this, is, this is pretty sweet for the moment. It's not going to be there forever. Uh, equipment requirements, uh, and these are some of the footnotes, and there's more than this, but this is an important one that I, I hadn't caught when I first looked. The solar water heating property must be uh, certified. Uh, FSEC, Florida Solar Energy Center, is one of the places where the manufacturer would send their stuff and they go through a whole battery of beating it up and chewing on it and spitting on it and measuring it. And, and it's kind of, there's a lot of stuff from China that hadn't been done and it's not that it's bad stuff, but this gives you a level of security. I think this is less important than it used to be a couple of years ago. Uh, there's there's kind of self-correcting mechanisms that there weren't at first. There was some junk out there, but everybody's stuff in general is a lot better than it used to be. From solar water, at least half of the energy uh, must come from that solar. So you've got to have a system that you know, is sized a large enough in verification that your, half your water heating is coming from solar. This is good to the end of 2016. Uh, here's a nice site that uh, gives you the uh, kind of the IRS uh, requirements that you must follow. And here is a tremendous site, no matter what the state, you punch in your zip code, it's mostly by state, will give you whatever utility, state, uniqueness, it's all in one spot. And this is pretty well maintained and updated. So if you're doing business you know, in Georgia, you, you can see you know, the, the changes there. G great website. <coughs> I don't know if I want to drag you guys through this, but you said you were kind of thinking about solar. Is that, is that for your house or no? No. Anybody? You know, well, I, I mean, leave, leave, it's, TVA is changing. And these are, as far as I can see, just rumors. And I don't know. But this is on their website. And you know, it kind of starts out, the good news is, not just a 10-year, but a 20-year contract. Now, you're going to sign your RECs, your renewable energy credits, for now, not for 10, but for 20 years. And you're not going to get 12 cents. In fact, the rumor is you're only going to get 9 cents. This will be starting next year. It'll be whatever you do now. And that's why I say it is, to me, I can't imagine a better time than between now and the end of December Seeing what you got in the piggy bank, if you ever dreamed of solar, it ain't going to get any better than this. I, I just, you know, just too many things have come together, including what TVA is doing. Because what they're saying is it's probably going to come down and probably right out the chute, nine cents. I just lost three cents. And then look at what they're saying. Uh, they may limit the program to whoever signs up for the green power switch. So if only 10 people sign up, then that nine cents is going to go to five cents. I don't like it. I'm sure many of us don't like this, but that's kind of the world that they would like to set this thing. That's how they started it, 
But then they had, actually had to infuse additional cash to keep this alive. But anyway, that's, you know, so, so know that that's looming. Same max capacity, same incentive. Uh, I kind of went through all that. So for years, 11 through 20, retail. That's all we're going to do. We're not, there's no incentive. Now, uh, like I said, I believe very much that you should start this juicy and become invisible. That's how you get this thing going. And, and you can see, you know, we've doubled our capacity in one year compared to everything. You know, it's working. You know, so do we want to, you know, increase these things? Not necessarily. Do we want to decrease? Well, not too fast, but we want to keep this, you know, kind of momentum going. All right. Uh, right now, uh, according to their website, there are 722 uh, generation partners. About 500 in the pipeline. You are looking at Uno. This was the very first generation partner in TVA system. 2002. That is where we started, and I started, all this stuff about zero energy houses. This was a dollar a day. I did four others. We got down to 48 cents. This was the very first one. Big celebration on the lawn. Cookies for everybody, lemonade, distributor there, TVA there, DOE there. Wonderful. This is going to be the start of a revolution. Number one, 2002. You just saw me say, there's 800 of them. Ten years. 80 a year. <laughs> I thought it was on to something big. <laughs> you can't argue with the numbers. Maybe it's just still a little early. Uh, somebody asked how did you know here it is uh, you know one bum, 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 bum. and 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 this is so important uh, don't go buy a bunch of stuff and then go try to do this you know contact your power distributor that's where you start you need a line diagram and any solar provider can do that but I'll tell you my very bright uh, son-in-law put this together himself he had circuits class, but he didn't have much else. He talked to me, talked to a few others. He put together a diagram, passed it, no problem. But you got to have that. And then you got you to you hear from them, okay, all your equipment, make sure it's UL stamped or game's off. We're not going to hook you up. So the distributor approves. He then sends it to TVA. They approve. Then you install your system. You get it inspected. When that inspection passes, they hook you up, you get your thousand bucks. What people want to do is get a good deal, buy the equipment, and then start. And you can run into some headaches with that. And I will tell you, just because I've got the bruises, the whips, the kicks, the pain, some power distributors just embrace you, help you. And there are others that you just think they don't care about their children. <laughs> you just, you know, not in my backyard. I don't, you know, I don't want it. And we'll, you, will, you will build an enemy, you know. So, you know, you've got to check this out first. And, 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 and unfortunately, it's not very equal across the valley. The distributors, there's good ones, and there's ones that, by golly, over my dead body. Yeah, and, and, and you know, the, the gentleman that left earlier is just, you know, life is about who's, who you have to answer to, <laughs> and he talked about the inspectors, you know. But, but, but I, I tell you, it's still, it's, it's one big earth, and, you know, we're Tennessee, and, and you know, and we've we got to really make, you know, ah. uh, U.S. solar photo manufacturing industry, you know, so a couple of intriguing stuff that's going on. Um, uh, manufacturers closing U.S. plants. Big story out in California. Lots of our tax money loan going to solar, you know, stiff competition from China. Slowing demand for solar panels as we speak. Uh, extraction of large quantities of natural gas from shales will lower the cost of electricity, and that's going to have a big impact on the economics. There's no question, short term. St uh, state level renewable fuel standards, which require certain percentages. So where there are public service commissions that 
the citizens have a voice and can say, Mr. Public Service Commission, please insist that some fraction of our power come from renewables. Those are there, those are fixed, they're all around us, they're nowhere in sight in TVA. In some parts of the United States, residential commercial PV system produce electricity prices at competitive with conventional grid. Uh, once subsidies are taken into account, so, and I've shown it here that it can work with the subsidies that we have. So those people that will come up to you and say, you know, I looked at that solar five years ago, it is absolutely not, you know, anywhere close. That, you really got to make sure that those numbers were crunched within the last couple of months. Uh, the per watt cost of PV systems has declined significantly. This is really, really t tells the whole story. China dominating the market. Okay, 2000. Okay, what color is China? Red. Where are they? Hmm, they're not even on the board. Uh, where are they today? Oh, 50%. And look at this growth. Now, when you, you heard that gentleman in our movie to start with, that German guy, he says, well, first you got to get your government on board, and then you can do what we did in Germany. And, and, and one of the big things is, you know, there's more solar in Germany than there is in any other country. Heavily subsidized, and what made sense to me and made sense to many people, besides the environmental good things, is that we're going to learn this stuff, and we're going to know how to put them in, build them better than anybody. And their inverters are incredibly good. And then the world will come to buy our stuff because we've had lots of practice putting it on. Okay, I don't have Germany here, but I got Europe. So 21, 27%, 28%, 27, 20, 13%. You know, so you got to watch out on these things because you know, if that was the investment that you were going to be a China, well, you may be falling off the map here. So um, it's just the way that this is done as far, and, and, and if you haven't heard, this is such an issue that it's been successfully argued to add a 31% tariff on imported Chinese solar collectors. I don't think I like that. Listen, are you talking about production of solar cells? Or uh, these are, these, these are, no, these are, pr pr this is, pr absolutely, this is production. This is where the solar modules are built. Now, you know, Sharp um, just gets disks shipped to them from Japan is where they, and they're, 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 there's a the big plant in Memphis. And we took a lot of our tax dollars to take a converted microwave oven menu and c convert it to PV. And, and that just is, all, so all what ships over is this. And then robots sprinkle it on to a substrate. Good Alcoa aluminum, our local aluminum is used. Good US glass is used. There is no jobs on the site. It's all robotic. It's very, has anybody toured the Volkswagen facility down the road? I got to do that a couple weeks ago. I don't know how you get in there, but it is cool. I mean, there's areas where there's no lights and there's moving things around. There are all these robots. There's 357 of them. And you go, well, why keep the lights on? You know, the robots know what to do. They don't need the lights. It's, it's, it's cool. And so is, this, so is this plant. But Sharp is not competitive anymore. It's, it's falling way behind. But you know, the, the idea I, I, I would hope is that, you know, where the, you know, that, that we could still be doing that assembly kind of stuff here. And, and the installers, it's a huge market for them. I mean, like I said, that small business I started is producing incredible large numbers of jobs. Uh, did China steal the uh, German technology? By steal. You know, now you're asking some tough questions. Now you're asking some tough questions. I, 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 will, I will say that, um, that, that's, that there is evolution within the, the efficiency, and there's a big race going on, who can get the most efficient collectors? And there's some stuff out there that is very, very efficient, but very, very expensive. But what they've obviously been able to do is, with their cheap labor, is, is get the, the total kind of KW or output cost down very, very little. So I suspect it's mostly, Here's another one, blew my head off. India and China is building a coal fire power plant every four days. Every four days they're putting up, I don't know how small a coal fire power plant you can do, but you can bet that there's a lot of energy that goes in from coal into the assembly of these. 
not a lot of air pollution on this. We all know that story. So, so, but the answer to the question, I'm sorry. I, I just don't know. But, I, it, but, but this isn't a technical break. I, I guess I'm saying this isn't, they're not taking the cutting edge stuff. They're taking yesterday's stuff and doing it a lot cheaper. Well, each one of my solar panels are evergreen 210 watt solar panels. I know them. That's in the frame, maybe. Frame, yes. My, uh, my frame was a, has a black border, where these frames have a silver border. And the only reason I can't add any more, now five watts really doesn't matter, but the, the uh, voltage was different. So I couldn't add any of these. And he's selling them for $1.65 a watt. And that was the cheapest, of, I don't know about now, but after I had already bought these other ones, I said, dang, $1.65 a watt is cheap compared to anything like Bill. And, uh, and the only difference is five watts and, you know, the border, who cares about the border? I don't care what color the border is, you know. And, uh, but I can't use, I couldn't mix any. Did you get your modules from Big Frog? No, I, well, my original one came from Big Frog. Uh, I had the, I had the, uh, I had the evergreen, um, each, each one came. Yeah, I got one house with those on them. You know, you may want to look into those microinverters because that, I think, gets you to 110, and now, now 110 is 110. It's true. Now you're worried about sensors. Pardon? How many sensors are actually coming off of all these different modules? I mean, you've got, you've got how many sensors the PDA science has got coming out of it? They're going in like crazy. Um, and, and would it be, what you're saying is, would it be different if it was on a, an evergreen versus a SunTac? I just don't know how they do microconverters to put it in the AC and mixing that together. Yeah, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm afraid I, I, I can't give a straight up easy answer. But, 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 but I do know the following. I do know that microinverters, now you're on the, the computer. I mean, you know, there's a lot of microelectronics, and, and indeed the price can be dropping pretty, pretty, pretty substantially with that. So it's got, a tr and with, with that warranty. Uh, in fact, the gentleman that was selling, he, he said, you know, if, if that fails, they'll even, they'll not only replace it, they'll pay you for your lost solar power. So that stuff's coming along pretty impressively. Um, I love this shot. Um, you know, here's uh, Milton Hill. TVA's taking this as a really, if you ever, go through, it's right off I-40, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory exit. But they have a wonderful display of all different types of uh, stuff. And, and I, you know, I, I, I like this, uh, you know, uh, more solar, less transmission, more wind, more transmission. <laughs> There's a windmill there too. I'm a big believer. I think this is gonna be good. Uh, solar LED lighting and lithium ion batteries, big upside growth, the combination there. That's their monument sign. Uh, solar charging station, there's one of them there. Uh, a couple of them in Knoxville, the little company has a solar garden, the Solar Futures, where they have two of these charging stations, two or three of the employees own Nissan Leafs. They charge at day, at night they charge off peak power. They got about a 20 mile commute. I think you're gonna see more and more of this. The, the Achilles heel is batteries, batteries, batteries. We always know that and a huge sum of money has been put in from Department of Energy, private industry on improving that battery. There's some impressive potential, you know, kind of things in the pipeline. But by the way, I was at a very high level strategic planning effort in 1980 at, at, at the laboratory director at Oak Ridge. The Achilles heel is batteries, still is batteries. But they're coming along. I'm going to always bet if I'm going to 
invest in stocks or whatever. We know for sure change is going to happen. We also know nobody's ever going to back off safety. Anybody that's been in a corporate world in the last couple of years, no, we are obsessed. We go out of our way. Forget about productivity. We're not going to hurt anybody. You know, so security is another thing. We are not going to back off that. So if you're talking about street lights and, and you, you can begin to pull this together or even close, we're going to have more lighting, more security in places where lines are not going to be. I think that's a good play. I think that's a great niche market. Walmart, uh, they played with all kinds of solar. I went and made all kinds of measurements. Uh, they had a bunch of stuff going. You kind of say, all right, do I really need to illuminate my stop sign? These are guys that make and have a lot of deep pockets. The most dangerous place in Walmart is where? When you walk out of that store, you're walking into cars. So it's not only gone from freezing cold to very hot of late, you're also hoping that people are awake and they're not wondering whether they remember to pick up their change or have their receipt or where their glasses are, their sunglasses. This is an area where attention is poor and they're walking out of a store where the biggest danger was banging into somebody else's cart into cars that are hopefully going very, very slow how many places are there like this? How much will people pay to avoid one lawsuit of somebody getting bumped into walking out of Walmart? You know, so this is good, 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 uh, good opportunity. Kind of schematically, uh, a little block diagram. You do, and and this. Well, let me just start this out for for a solar system coupled with LED street lighting. Uh, you know, this is kind of, if you will what the path has to be. The sun shines during the day, the light is needed at night, I need to charge, I need a battery. And so this is the combination, but uh, believe that, that uh, uh, there are some things to be worked out, but this is a, 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 nice, a nice, again, niche, niche opportunity. Um, we measured for uh, three years all kinds of great stuff here, and Walmart has taught me so many things, but, and, and since I left the public sector and now getting into the private sector, I've practically given myself a way to get back in here. They're very, very, very tough on anybody that sells into them, but they're very uh, opportunist, opportunistic, and, and, and what they have the capability of doing is bigger than the government or any state, they have all these vendors that live and die off that Walmart account. Uh, 6,000, I don't know, 10,000. And what they're doing is they're pushing these requirements. How could you possibly be offer me the lowest cost for the Coke if you've got T12s in your warehouse? I'm going to Pepsi. And, and they ever so subtly, soft hand at first, firmer as it goes, are pushing back through all their vendors and have enormous, enormous uh, power to change things. Uh, we played with all different types of stuff, solar on the, you know, laid on the mats. Uh, more iconic than anything else, but this is the, you know, where your plants are grown. Greenhouse, yes, but, but had some solar generation. Uh, I've got numbers here, but uh, the uh, vestibule coming in, they also had the glass with the PV. The clear story, this is very nicely daylit, where a lot of people are sad that their pockets just got emptied, and, and, and so uh, good daylight helps them feel less sad. Uh, you know, critical part, they lower the roof, but um, not, not incredible efficiency with putting solar on a wall, but, uh, but nice, again, iconic, you know, Walmart, you know, is trying to, trying to walk their talk. A little exercise of, uh, and this back to, you know, what we're talking about as far as helping you make some decisions on solar modules. It, it's not only about efficiency, and, and I think so many times it's, it used to be like, if I wait tomorrow, I'll get a better computer for less price. Same kind of argument here. And this is uh, a, a website that they 
apparently they don't sell collectors, but they sell inf solar information. And I would argue that these are some of the top available that does have the sharps in here, uh, but some of the kind of top collectors. And they go through some metrics. And the argument is, you know, green is, green is the top, red is the bottom. So if you look at this, you kind of say, well, there's some reds and bottoms just about, about everywhere, except Sharp has no greens. They only have reds. But uh, the, the cost you know, per output, very, very important. So notice these here, the sun powers. Um, they are pretty high as far as cost per DC watt, 2.71 compared to 420. So let's take a look at what the efficiencies are. And we kind of do the same thing here, this top tier, bottom tier. So the most uh, efficient are like 17%, but uh, Sanyo Sun Power, 16%. Uh, the one that I think ended up being the highest on the other side was in the neighborhood of 15. So you, you end up, if you're only choosing efficiency, you wouldn't necessarily, let's see, what is the one? So let's just take that Sun Power. Ah, uh, maybe we should take the Sanyo. So Sanyo is the top one at 17.2 for, that's the efficiency. Uh, not on there. Let's take Sun Power, 16.8%. Sun Power here, yeah, okay, that's a good example. So when it comes to delivery, that 16, a little bit higher efficiency, it had the higher cost per delivered watt. So, Point is, look at the cost per watt, not the efficiency for your shopping metric. Uh, tons of sites like this, but this is somebody doing the economics. And, and it kind of a couple of things here. You know, this is like an overall life cycle analysis. And yeah, if I put the same system here, I get 33,000. I only get about half of that in Tennessee. But so what? It, this is a positive number. It's not a. a it's big, but still viable. I don't want to get into what the numbers were that were used. Whenever I talk about solar, I always get the question, I heard that, and I alluded to this earlier with the coal power plants going into the production of solar, how much embodied energy is in solar collectors? I heard that, that it took more energy to make than you'd ever get out of them. Well, in anticipation, if you don't ask it, thinking about it, I gave, this is, this is a, a nice piece of work that was done by NREAL where they actually looked at how many years of generation it took to pay back the energy. And with the multi-crystalline, three and a half years. Now, is that acceptable? Um, don't know, but it kind of, somebody that spent the good time trying to look into truly the amount of energy that it goes into the assembly of these. So that's it. We're on a break. Uh, I think brownies and drinks are right outside. Uh,